Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Hello and welcome back to the Exodus Cry podcast. Today we have with our special guest, Katerina McLeod. Uh, she is a survivor of sex trafficking, as well as the founder of an organization called Rising Angels, which provide support services to women who are exiting um, sex trafficking and the sex industry. So uh, enjoy this podcast. Thank you so much for watching. It's a really, really powerful story. I'm so glad that you are joining us for this podcast. There's a lot happening in the culture right now, just around the subject of the commercial sex industry. We often see stories and hear people talking about and promoting the idea of sex work as a liberating, empowering experience, as a legitimate form of work. Um, OnlyFans has become like a huge thing. And prostitution in general has really um, accelerated and become so normalized within our culture today. You have lived through that experience of being in the sex industry, and I'm just so grateful for you joining us on our podcast to help share some of your story and how you feel about the where our culture is at right now related to this issue. So maybe you could just start off by sharing a little bit of insight into how you were drawn into the sex industry and what your experience of it was like. Yeah, no, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, the misconceptions um, with what's happening today in our world is really scary. And so what I've, my own experience and from what I've experienced in the mentorship that I now do with women is for me, I started being groomed very young. It was my father who was sexually abusing me. And as a child, when that's happening, because you love your dad, you know, and then he starts to sexually you know, assault you, you don't understand that it's wrong. Um, along the way, a couple other men start to sexually abusing, abuse me. But by that time, I kind of felt like that was my worth. Um, I knew how to satisfy a man sexually. I knew how to get attention. And I kind of brought that with me into my teenagehood. So looking for love, um, mistaking sex for love, and I used that to my benefit to get the attention that I was lacking, to fill that daddy hole in my heart. And ended up pregnant at 14 years old, was already drinking and doing drugs. And I ended up in very abusive relationships with men. Um, I was dating men at 12 years old who were twice my age. Um, so I was kind of just being groomed all the way around. And at 17, I had met a man who was very, very abusive. And I married him because to me, it was like, this is what men did. So we got married, we had a baby together. He was in and out of prison constantly. And um, one of the last times he went to prison, um, every time he would go to prison, whoever was his, I call them flavor friend of the month, would kind of have to keep an eye on me, make sure I was being a good wife, take me for jail visits, that kind of stuff. And so his friend did that um, and we became friends. But my, my husband at the time was like, you know, he'd get me to bring jail visits, wanting me to smuggle in drugs, you know, pinching me under the table at visits, like still verbally and, you know, physically assaulting me. And after I was removed from him for a little while, I realized I didn't want to be abused anymore. And I had said to him, you know, I don't want to be married. And he was like, you know, I'll get better. I'll, you know, he was an addict. All kinds of crazy was going on. And I said, okay, if you can get sober, get a job, get help, I'll come back. Because by this time I had two children. And unfortunately, the friend, his friend took it upon himself to murder my husband. And in that murder, he involved me after the fact and basically held me and my kids for three years um, prisoner. In that time, I was allowed to file for a divorce, um, get a restraining order, and he wanted me to join a woman's abuse group um, about what my husband had done, but obviously I couldn't tell anybody. And in that group, you know, you're very vulnerable. You share the abuse you've been through with other women. And there was this woman who was big and blonde and, you know, she was voluptuous and outspoken. And she came to me one day after group and, you know, she asked me if I wanted a job. And I said, well, what, what's the job? And she said, well, 
you would have to have sex with men for money. And at that time, I thought if I could do this, I could escape the situation that I was in. I could save money. And then part of me was like I was so used to already having sex with all these men for free. So what was the big deal? Hmm. So I ended up in that situation and I started, um, she started prostituting me. And I, I was still with the murderer. Um, that whole situation was happening. He knew what I was doing, but he was okay with it because this woman turned out to be his father's ex-girlfriend. So everybody was kind of keeping an eye on me, uh, making sure I wasn't going to the police. It was a whole slew of craziness, but you know, the drugs amped up. Um, I was trying to numb what I had, you know, seen. He, like I said, he brought me after the fact. So he buried my husband in front of me and I was terrified. I was 19 years old. Um, at that time it happened. I was 21 when I ended up going into the sex industry. I finally went to the police. I turned him in three years later. I was so beaten and broken um, that I couldn't take any more. Like death would have been a blessing to me, but I had children. And that's what I think kept me going. And from there, it just escalated. I went full throttle into the sex trade. I was working at a strip joints, massage parlors, my car, hotels. And I did that for over 10 years. And then I ended up meeting a pimp. And, mm. you know, I knew about pimps. I knew about that stuff. And I was like, I'm independent. That will never happen to me. But in this search of my life, all I wanted was to be loved. So that's what I was looking for. So when I met somebody um, who was a pimp, I knew he was a pimp. Um, he sold me the dream. Mm. You know, we can have a family together. We can have a life. We can have all of those things that I so deeply craved. And I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. And we ended up having two more children together. And um, after my second child, when I was pregnant with my second child, I was two weeks away from giving birth. There was a knock on my door. It turned out to be his wife. He had eight other children. A month after I gave birth to my last child, my eldest daughter at the time came to me and told me how my pimp had been raping her. So that kind of just, again, set the stage for, you know, the chaos that was going on in my own life. So I, I dug deeper into drugs. I dug deeper into prostitution. I now didn't have all the rules that I had along the way. I just didn't care. And so I was on a mission, I think, to, you know, destroy myself without physically doing it and being held accountable for it. But at the same time, I'm trying to take care of my kids because now I had four kids, no supports, no nothing no education. I had a great ed education. So I just was on this highway to hell. Mm. And that's how I ended up in this whole position. It's interesting hearing some of your story because in our society and our culture, oftentimes women in prostitution, prostituted women are viewed as throwaways. Yes. The way that they're spoken about in pop culture film, it's the use of the, even the vernacular, the term prostitute. Yes. The way that's thrown around is treated as though these people are throwaways. Mm -hmm. But children, we need to rescue. So there's a lot of saber rattling in the culture about child rescue. Absolutely. Um, and um, it's a great... So, of course, we want to rescue children who are in exploited positions. That's an extreme minority of people who actually are in the sex industry being exploited. The vast majority are people who were children and later had their 18th birthday. Yes. And they're still living in this system of exploitation. And um, so I think it's interesting in your story because some people may hear you talk and immediately put you into that category of somebody who was a prostitute. Right, right. So I, I think it's interesting going back to your childhood and looking at the dynamics that were present in your childhood that actually set a trajectory for your life. Absolutely. Because as long as people can... Um, alleviate themselves of any kind of responsibility or accountability to this larger injustice that, that we're facing of people being exploited in the sex industry. We assign 
we have to assign choice yes. to those who are in it. Well, she chose this and that's different. Yeah. But how do you qualify the choice of somebody whose agency was taken from them as a child and a trajectory set forth for them to go into this? So all those dynamics for me are like really um, interesting and important to explore to understand the reality of what's happening and how people wind up in these exploited positions. So you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say a couple of things. I think, you know, you hit it like head on when you say like, you know, I was 36 years old when I finally was able to get out of this and there was nothing, there was no help for me because there's an like age cut off how we see victims. You know, when you're an older woman, you have choice, but people don't see you know, what happened before somebody ever entered into it. I consciously made a decision, but subconsciously I was ruined mm -hmm. and didn't understand the choice that I had made. And that's what a lot of people think. The women I mentor today all come from some form of sexual abuse, bullying. You know, they have issues in their own life that made them vulnerable to this. So you know, I I really fight for the older women who are stuck here, who who everybody doesn't see as victims, not understanding how did they get there? Because at the end of the day, I don't think you wake up and you go, well, hey, when I'm older, I want to be a prostitute. It just doesn't happen. You know, if you come from somewhere good, you know, worth is instilled into you. Mm -hmm. um, education, all of those things are something mm -hmm. that is instilled into you deeply. And those things weren't instilled to me or to most of the women that I walk alongside with now. Mm. How old were you when you first experienced abuse from your father? The earliest memory I have is two, two. Uh -huh. So my father was very addicted to pornography. And the funny thing was, is he was a Sunday school teacher. So I was exposed to the church. I would go to church and sing on stage. And, and I love Jesus. Like it was like Santa Claus, you know, he could see me when I was sleeping kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. He knew everything I did. And when this started to happen, I can remember the hate that I started to get for this, this so-called Jesus at the time. Well, if you're real, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Why am I going through this? And mm -hmm. you know, my father having you know a position in the church was so confusing to me. And he would sit down and, and make me watch porn with him. And I remember like watching pornography and he would be drinking. And then on Sunday he put on his you know good suit and we go to church. And this just continued to happen. But because it was my dad, it, it's not a bad thing until other men started to come along and sexually abuse me between five and seven. Then I was like, this just doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. But who was I going to tell? Mm -hmm. You know, who was going to believe me? You know, um, nobody. How do, you, how do you feel that affected your, your view of the world, your, your worldview when that abuse started? How do you think that shaped the way that you understood the world? To me, I thought that this is what men were. This is what they did. Um, I trusted nobody. I became very aggressive and very violent. Um, and I carried that throughout my whole life. You know, I was a fighter. I would go looking for fights. I would beat men up. You know, men were beating me up. I had a lot of hatred inside of me and a lot of just anger, anger for everything that, you know, being an adult now and, and you know, having my own children and, thinking like he was supposed to be the nurturer and the adult and show me what love is supposed to be and how a man should treat me. And he took that from me. So that was like the catalyst to everything. So I, I hated men, even though I, I was with men and dating men. To me, if you were a man, you that label, you were no good. So it was so confusing growing up. Like I ended up dabbling into like witchcraft and Satanism and, and looking for something other than God because God failed me. And so I started, you know, doing things that were just horrific and horrible. And it just, it all just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse as time went on. And, you know, to have kids who witnessed the abuse, who seen, you know, drunken stoned mommy and, you know, would I come home and they'd, you know, take off my clothes and put me to bed and hold my hair while I was throwing up or, you know, mommy has bruises, mommy's getting beaten up. Like that was their normal. So I think people really need to understand that, you know, this doesn't just affect the person that is happening to it, it affects everybody around them. You know, like when I'm mentoring women, 
I'm mentoring moms as well. I'm mentoring families who are affected by what's happened to the daughter, you know? So it's not just the victim, it's, it affects everybody. It affected my children, you know, the way that they grew up, um, the moral compass that they had, everything. A term that's thrown around a lot with, and on the subject of prostitution, is this term of empowerment. Right. And again, I think that many people would rather, um, disown their own responsibility at facing the vulnerability of exploited women in our culture, um, than face the, the truth of what's going on and the sense of responsibility that comes with that. So the, the terminology around this that people use to let themselves off the hook right. are things like, you know, what about the women who are empowered? What about, what about, what about? In your experience, how many other women did you meet who were also involved in the sex industry? And in your experience and the experience of the women that you knew, where do you think this idea of empowerment came into play? I don't, so when it, I said, oh, it's so frustrating because when it comes to empowerment, um, you know, I always hear my body, my choice, you know, um, I get to make my own hours, pick my own clientele. That doesn't exist. That doesn't happen. Um, this is a very, th this is a thriving market. You know, there's John's more tricks are on, you know, sites talking to each other about who's good, who's not, what she'll do, what she won't do. It takes away your power. Like empowerment to me is like, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're, you've got a good job, you're doing legit work. There's no such thing as empowering in the sex trade. Somebody, once they pay money for you, is, is they own you. They get to do whatever they want and you need to comply whether you like it or don't like it. Hmm. You know, the abuse that I suffered at the hands of my tricks, um, I've had my jaw, jaw dislocated. I've been anally raped. I've mm. been beaten. I've been choked. I've been spit on. Like, where's the empowerment in that? You know, this is one of the jobs that you go to work and don't know if you're coming home from, you know? So I think what's happened is we live in a culture right now that is so over-sexualized, so glorified. You know, everybody is about, you know, being an influencer. It's all about your body and, you know, looking good and selling yourself. Even the lingo that's used, you know, my, my son came to me one day and he said, mom, you know, it's normal to have a main girlfriend and a side girlfriend. <laughs> that's pimp language. So our children are living in pimp culture right now and they're getting lured in. We have OnlyFans, we have all of that stuff, which is just like, oh, it's no big deal, sugar daddying and all of that. And by the time our children get lured into this, they don't even see it happening and it's too late. So that's what I see ha happening in this generation, which is totally scary to me because it's making it harder. You know, when I have a 15 year old girl who, whose mom's reached out to me because now she's dabbling in the game and I go and speak to her and try to talk sense to her, she's like, I'll, I'll never be as stupid as you. I'll never be dumb like you. And I'm like, oh, you just wait. And then years later she comes back because she's realized I'm trapped and this is worse than I thought it would be because a lot of people start off prostituting themselves and they end up trafficked. You know, you can't be in the game and not have a pimp eventually. That's, you know, this is their territory. You're their money, you're their product. So they're looking all the time. They're sitting in the strip joints now. You know, we used to have front row, which was called pig row um, for the men, but you'll see all the pimps sitting there now because they're waiting, they're watching their girls and they're recruiting new girls. So it's, it's happening so in your face but it's just become so normalized. Mm -hmm. That's what scares me. It's become so normalized. The, the issues of um, violence and exploitation and just the degradation. And, and can you elaborate on some of what you're kind of inferring to with the men? What were the men like? Because again, these men are paraded out by the pro-sex work movement. And they are shown to be these really nice <laughs> guys yeah. who are just lonely and need access to, you know, the comfort of a woman. Right. It's kind of like how they are spoken about. Um, 
in your experience, what were the men like? The attitudes they held, the behaviors they engaged in? You know what? It, as soon as the money was given, they were different. Um, be, as soon as that door shut, and this is another thing I think with the pros, you know, they're like, oh, if you let us, you know, be able to, you know, look at our clientele and talk to them and kind of find out if they're bad or good, give us five minutes, you know, we're going to know. Absolutely not. I had clients that I seen for a year, two years, and all of a sudden became so violent. So there's no way of being able to measure that. You know, I had men who were fathers, men who were lawyers, men who were judges, men who were police officers, men who were in higher positions who would come in and they dress They'd want me to dress as a little girl. They'd want me to act like a little girl. They'd pull out rape scenes on me. Um, I remember having a grandfather come in. I was, and he said to me, oh, you know, I'm here because I was watching my 13-year-old granddaughter sunbathe and it made me horny. And it, you know, in the moment, you just, I wanted to beat the crap out of him. But this was my job and this is what I was getting paid for. So... You know, yes, there were clients who were lonely. There were clients whose wives were dying and, you know, they could no longer be intimate with them. So I would fill that void. Or there were clients who had these fantasies and fetishes that they couldn't, they would dare not act out at home, but they would come and act it out on me. You know, porn was huge. You know, porn is huge today for the fact that it's driving. You know, it's all about being submissive for the women and dominance and aggression and all of that stuff. That's the kind of sex that these men would have with me. Hair pulling, spitting, punching me, um, holding me down, covering my mouth, you know, wanting me to urinate on them. Um, then, you know, dominatrix stuff, you know, tying them up, burning them, cutting them. Like it was crazy. The things that men wanted me to do. And I, I, I would have men walk in in Armani suits and they look so good and well together and behind closed doors, they were just violent. They were violent. I was a product to them. I was something that for them to get off on. And that's what it became. And when I worked in parlors and I worked, you know, anywhere that somebody was a boss or a pimp of me, if I got beat up in that room, I had to get myself together for the next client. You know, so there was no empathy on that. It was how much money I was gonna make for somebody else how many clients I could bring in, how popular I became, and what I was willing to do. When you've been through enough experiences like that, how does that, the accumulation of that, how does that affect the way then that after, you know, X number of these horrible encounters, now you've got to see another one? And then how does that affect your psychology going into that situation? And how do you survive that experience of, opening up to another man when all these previous men have brought these horrible perverted fantasies um, and uh, physically abused you, threatened you. I mean, there, how would you describe that experience emotionally? Of the, now, now you're going into another one. Well, I mean, who I was was gone. You know, um, I became, you know, my last working name was Taylor. I became her. She was like my alter ego. So more drugs, you know, um, to numb myself. I became violent. You know, when I first started this, I was such a victim in the sense of like, they would beat me up, they would hurt me, and I would allow it. Now I started fighting back, you know, and I wanted to kill them. Like, I became so perverted and twisted in my own self, even when I had relationships outside of being sexually exploited, it was the same. I was so violent. I was so aggressive. Um, I almost started to like it. Like that just became so normal to me. Nothing else in the world existed besides that violence. If I was dating you and you weren't choking me out and beating me while we were having sex, I, I couldn't be with you. I didn't know how to separate it anymore. And so the men I started bringing home that were around my kids were so violent. And they, they witnessed it, but it was normal. If you were nice to me, no, you were a wimp, you weren't a man, you were no good. Because that was my normal. And everything became survival, you know. There were times I remember driving home after servicing 10 men and, and being so physically sore. 
and just screaming at the top of my lungs and wanting to die. Like I wanted to kill myself every single day, but I was scared to do that because of what I would do to my children. So it got to a point where I knew I was gonna kill somebody or I was gonna kill myself. So I knew like it was coming to that tipping point for me. Your world became just hopeless. Yes. Yeah, there was, there was nothing. Um, yeah. Hopeless. You know, mm -hmm. disposable. Like I didn't matter to anybody. I became a bankroll for everybody. My family knew what I was doing. Nobody once came up to me and said, Kat, what are you doing? Or you deserve better. He was like, do you have money I could borrow? Could you pay this off? So I almost felt obligated, like I had to take care of everybody and nobody took care of me. Yeah. Unseen. Yeah. Everybody knew. I wasn't quiet about what I did. My family knew, my mother knew, my friends knew, everybody knew. And nobody cared. Nobody cared. I was just this badass girl. And maybe they see me as so tough because I was tough. That it, it you know, I could take care of myself. You know, there are times I come home beat up and people would say, oh my God, what happened? And I tell them and it was like no big deal. So maybe because it was no big deal to me, it was no big deal to anybody else. And maybe if anybody would have tried to convince me to leave, I would have laughed in their face because what else was I going to do? I didn't have an education. I didn't have support. I didn't know anything else. It was normal. What was it that brought you out of that dark place? Oh, well, first of all, I had a, an amazing daughter who became a Christian very young. And in my journey to try to, I guess, get back with my father, feel some sort of relationship with him. He was still going to church. So I started attending a church that he was attending when I was an adult. And I brought my daughter and she stayed. I left um, and she got saved. And so it was funny because <laughs> she we share a stage together now and she'll tell her story of how she literally had to pray to God to even love me because I was a scary person. I was, <laughs> I was angry. And I would come home sometimes and there would be like, um, you know, scriptures posted on my door about how God's seen me and how he loves me. And I was just like, like, who are you kidding? And I had been 15 years in at this point and I met a client. And this client actually was to me different than the rest. And we kind of got emotionally involved which was the cardinal rule, you don't do that. But I did, and he offered me an out. And he said, if you leave, I'll take care of you and your kids financially. And at that moment, I knew I had to do it because I was gonna, I was gonna kill somebody. I was gonna kill a client. And I left. And when I left, I literally started volunteering with organizations and telling my story, um, not understanding that there was a healing process. I was still a drug addict. Um, and then I kind of became a private prostitute for him. He controlled the money, he controlled allowance, he controlled everything. I wasn't allowed to get a legit job. Um, there was always an excuse. So three years after <clears throat> literally being out and sharing my story and in sharing my story, I was re-victimizing myself because I, I, I wasn't healing. Three years later, he decided he was gonna leave me. <clears throat> And when he was gonna leave me, I had nothing. I had no money, I had nowhere to go. So I was gonna go back to what I knew. And that was prostituting. So I called my daughter and I told her, and she was heartbroken. And she was crying and begging. And I said, what am I gonna do? And she called me back and she said, mom, there's these people in her church. She was in a youth group. And she had spoke to the woman in the youth group and said, this is what's happening with my mom. And they offered to pay first and last month's rent for me. And I said, oh no, absolutely. First of all, Jesus people, no. Secondly, what do I owe somebody if, if you know, nothing was for free. So I made an appointment with a client and I remember sitting on that hotel bed 
and thinking, oh my God, Kat, if you do this, all of the women that you've helped save up to this point, it's for nothing. And then I knew if I went back, I wouldn't come back. So I left. I didn't go through with the transaction. I called my daughter and I said, okay, I'll do it. And that was the journey. So I met this woman who I had known through my daughter. I didn't like her. I thought she was a snooty Christian woman who thought she was better than me. I, I just didn't like her. And now here I was in a position of her and her husband going to pay my rent for me to find a place. And um, it started a journey. I couldn't find a place. I had no credit. Um, I didn't, you know, obviously it's funny. You know, you think when you come out of this, you're coming out rich. You never do. You, I came out with so much debt. And the only place that I could find was five minutes away from this woman's house. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is hilarious. Now, the eye-opening thing for me is my birth name's not Katerina. I was not born with this name. But every time I had heard my birth name, it reminded me of my trauma with my father and all of the chaos. So I wanted to change my name. And I wasn't a Christian yet. And I remember thinking, I'm going to change my name. And my daughter called me and she said, Mom, I believe God has a new name for you. I still wasn't a Christian. And I was like, oh, how do you know this? <laughs> and um, I went to sleep that night and I heard the word Katerina three times. I got up and Googled it and it means pure. And I knew at that moment that was my name. So I took this money from these, this woman and her husband and she just started to like come for coffee and walk alongside of me. And she became my mentor, her and her husband. And they've walked with me for 12 years. And I was like, I need to do something. And together we built Rising Angels. And that has just been where it is. I went to an alpha, you know, she's a church lady. She's been in the church for over 25 years. I feel obligated now that she's gave me the money to go to church. So I go sit in church on Sundays. I'm like, oh my God, I hate this. You know, and I think the biggest trigger for me was going into a church, knowing my father. Yeah. It, it just triggered me all yeah. the time. But she said, you know, you want to go to Alpha? And I thought, oh, great. She really wants to go to Alpha. So I'm going to have to go with her. She gave me this money. And I went to Alpha. And um, in the ninth week of Alpha, I went into Alpha very, very broken. I was sobbing. I There was a situation that I had gotten into again. And um, I left Alpha on a mission to commit suicide. I just had it. And I drove my car from nine o'clock at night till 12, 35 a.m. I would like speed up to the poles and then back off. I think, well, what if I do this and I don't die? And you know, all this started happening. And literally I heard a voice say, just give me a chance. And I knew the voice because I had been exposed as a child. If I say there's one good thing about my father is that I was exposed to church and God's voice. That's what did it. And I knew that voice and I pulled over my car and I said, okay, God, if you're real, do what you need to do. And it wasn't fireworks, there wasn't anything like that, but that void that I tried to fill with sex and drugs and men and money was instantly filled. And that's what started my journey to freedom. That's what did it for me. Hi guys, this is Benji Nolo from Exodus Cry, and I'm just so excited to announce the release of my new book called uh, Raised on Porn. This is something that I've been working on for the past 10 years and just uh, excited to get it into your hands to help deepen your understanding of porn, its impact on our world, uh, on our lives, and what we can do to heal from it. And so I think you're gonna find this to be an extremely insightful and helpful resource, whether you are somebody who is struggling with porn consumption, whether you're a parent and, uh, and wanting to help uh, have better conversations with your kids and protect your kids, uh, whether you're an educator, whether you're uh, in a relationship and, and, and this has in some way affected your relationship, I think this, is, this book's gonna be a super helpful resource. I wrote it in such a way um, to uh, be that resource that I wish was there when I started into this. So it's comp both comprehensive and in-depth. 
And if you're looking for a one-stop shop, so to speak, I think this is that book that you can get a hold of that's really going to give you the big picture and and an in-depth way of how porn is affecting our world and us as individuals and our relationships and our children. And again, what we can do to, to heal, to find freedom, to, uh, and to, to really to, to better our society. And so um, I encourage you, get a hold of this book, Raised on Porn, and share it with a friend as well. Thanks so much. It's interesting hearing some of your story because it does uh, bring up, it illuminates this idea that the quality of our life is directly commensurate with the measure of love yes. that we give and receive. Mm-hmm. And when that that well of love is supposed to be filled, um, st- you know, starting through your childhood uh, is in some way violated or diminished or not given or somehow broken all the broken cisterns that we look to to drink from to fill that Mm -hmm. and just the irony that it only drives us deeper into the pain the darkness um, those feelings of um, uh, low self-worth wanting to act out against others um, all of that and um, I think that your story is really powerful because all of us humans have experienced times where we felt love and we've also experienced times where we felt unloved. Right. Your journey really highlights the consequences of a life where love has been so deeply broken and damaged and not given uh, appropriately and all of those things. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that love that you felt with, in that moment, the, that, that feeling that came into you that s- began to satisfy that deeper place of need right. that everything else couldn't and how that brought you out. Because I think, I'll just say this last thing before you jump in, because I think a lot of people out there will listen to this that maybe they haven't been in prostitution maybe some have but they identify with that feeling of hopelessness um and that that darkness that helplessness like i and um i think i i my desire is for some of your own journey to speak to those people to maybe help pull them out of that place of darkness and understand there is a path forward. And so in your own experience, if you could talk about how that feeling came into you and what, and what nurtured that through your path of healing and recovery. So I think, you know, obviously living the life that I, I led hardened so many parts of me and put up walls that were huge. Because I think if I think about my journey now, I can look back on times that, you know, I could see where God was trying to talk to me, but it was falling on deaf ears. Um, I could see if you were nice to me, I was, I became susp- suspicious of you and you weren't getting in. But that moment in my car for me where I just finally, it's like this person that I had become, these walls that I had built, I surrendered and said, okay, enough, like enough, whatever it takes to take this pain out of me. And, and yes, that void was filled in that moment, but I still had the journey of all of the damage. How do I trust people to love me? How do I accept love? How do I give love? I didn't, I wasn't a good mom. I didn't know how to love my kids. They had everything they needed. They had a roof, they had clothes, they had food, but emotionally I wasn't that person. So when I had my mentor, come alongside of me who you know she she showed the love she gave me the love her husband him being a man you know I I didn't know how to be in the presence of a man without flirting with him or you know because it was all about making money it was that's what I learned so to be around him and 
be like, he doesn't want anything from me. He, he just accepts me for me. And starting to allow that relationship to build. And that was probably the first crucial relationship that I ever had that was healthy. And it, it was a journey. I mean, I put, I put her through hell and back. I tested her. And I still test people today because there's this thing in the back of my mind of like, you're going to hurt me. Mm. You know, you're going to fail me. And if I don't expect anything, you can't hurt me. So once the walls start to come down and you realize that you're a product of what's happened to you, you didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve what happened to me at all. But for years, I, I felt like I did. And because I got deeper and deeper and deeper into really bad things, those were my choices. I did this to myself, but I didn't. It's just one thing builds on the other and the other and the other, mm -hmm. and it's just this domino effect that happens. And when I finally could just stop and, and say, you deserve something more. You deserve to be that mom. You know, that's, that's what kept me alive, honestly, were those kids. Mm. So, you know, being emotional with them and loving them and apologizing and listening because there was a lot of people I had to apologize to because I hurt people along the way, you know? And as I started accepting that love, it felt foreign. It felt uncomfortable. It felt yucky. It really did. But I knew I wanted it mm. and I wanted it right. Mm. I always, in the back of my head, I knew what love was supposed to feel like. I really did. I just didn't achieve it. I didn't know how. So. It kind of when it starts happening, when you start letting those walls down and letting somebody come in and nurture you and love you, and even with God, you allow that to happen, it just starts breaking off of you really fast, really, really, really fast. And my healing has been, you know, I've been out for 15 years and I've been healing for 15 years and I will continue to heal. But to be on this side going, I just turned 51. I can't even believe I'm saying that. I just turned 51 years old. I never thought that I would be here today. And to be here and know that there's people that love me, genuinely love me, and I trust them. Like Sheila, my mentor, she's my rider. She's my ride or die. That's what I call her. And I trust her with my whole being because she genuinely wants what's good for me, you know? And from what I've gone through to be able to have that opportunity to have my organization Rising Angels and and help other women to get from A to B. Mm. That's a gift. That's such a gift. It's a gift. It's a hard gift, but you know, you have to be equipped <laughs> to understand, right? So I try to look at the things that were our blessings now. And I try to get up every day and push forward, even when I don't feel like it. And I'm gentle with myself now, you know, where before I wasn't, I, you know, I get beat up. I had to deal with the next client. Um, I, you know, I'm high, I'm sick, I'm this, I'm that. Now, if I'm overwhelmed and I shut down, it's okay. It's okay. I love that. I love the, the, the space, the healing space that you have created for yourself these past 15 years um having a mentor and that support mm -hmm. even if it's just one person yeah a support system doesn't always have to look like 10 people it could be one person who's faithful to you and um i love how that's been such a powerful part of your own journey and healing when i think about your story and your journey it, all of your life experiences from your earliest childhood memories communicated to you, don't trust, men aren't safe, the world isn't safe, God isn't safe, Yes. <laughs> take matters into your own hands, survive, and yet somehow you found the courage to surrender at that moment. And I don't mean to sound paternalistic. I'm just so proud of you for yeah. <laughs> thank you finding some way in yourself to trust again. And um, I just want to ask you about that part of your faith. 
how God revealed himself to you Ooh. as you began to just surrender. Oh my God, there's so many Gaha, God aha moments. I, I do have a tattoo on me that says DTA, which means don't trust anyone. Mm. Um, and I, 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 like I'm, I'm covered in them and I would go and mark my body up every time I was stressed of just horrible things. But God, you know, through my journey, I've got some serious counseling. And, you know, my daughter will tell you she prayed for eight years for me, and she did. And I think for her, when she seen that, you know, the day I called her and said, I'm leaving, she she was beside herself just crying and rejoicing. And, you know, we pray together now. We, we, we tell our stories now. Like, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, I can remember saying to God, I'm angry. I'm angry at you. Like, where were you? Where were you when all of this was happening? And God speaks to me very, very clear. He'll show me through vision or he's very audible to me. And he gave me a vision <clears throat> of a time that I was being raped. And um, I can remember the whole scene and you know the man was on top of me and he was raping me and I was crying and when I turned my head to the side Jesus was there and he was lying on his side holding my hand and he said I was always there he told me that because we have free will there's evil in this world and people will do bad things and it wasn't that he did it or he made it happen but he walked through it with me because I think of the guns I've had held to my head, mm -hmm. in my mouth, in my vagina, and Russian roulette played on me. I should be dead. He also gave me another vision, and it was amazing. I was with a Christian counselor, and we had hit on my father, and I had never really spoke about it. For a long time when I told my story, I told the story of five years old abuse starting, and that was when one of my abusers started. I never spoke of my father because I somewhere felt like I couldn't. And so we hit it with my, my counselor. I hit it with her. And I remember leaving and leaving that appointment and going, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the next week. It hit me the catalyst of everything that I went through happened because of him. And I thought I was going to die. It hurt so bad. And then God started giving me all these flashes of things that were happening. And I'm just like, I don't know if I, I can do this. And I made it to the next appointment. And in that appointment, God started giving me visions. And it was really weird because she would pray for me. But before she started praying, I had this vision of three angels. And they were back to back. And there was this huge crystal like, that covered like the whole entire globe. And it just shattered. And as it shattered, she started praying for God to break things off of me. And I seen these angels sweeping up all these pieces of crystal on the, on the floor, just sweeping them up like that was their job. And then I watched God come in and take the sword of righteousness and behead my father. And it wasn't gruesome. It wasn't bloody. He just beheaded him. And in that moment, it never hurt again. Mm. it never hurt again wow you know god has done some amazing things and especially in the past few to three years with this COVID and everything it brought me closer to him it brought me closer and he softened me i'm like everybody calls me mama og you know i'm tough i'm hard i you know cat don't cry cat don't this and now i am I'm softening up. My son said it to me the other day. We were sitting out front talking and he's like, I'm like, yeah, you know, I got gangster. I'm still gangster. And he's like, mm, you're becoming a soft gangster. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like, that's because I'm healing. That's because I'm healing. And I've held on to this tough person for so long because that's been my protection. And it's kind of scary to think, oh, what if I'm soft? And now if I'm mean, God will be like, you need to go apologize. I'm like, are you? kidding and he's he'll like be like no so i try to be so obedient and listen to him and i'm not perfect i'm not perfect i still have my struggles i still have healing and things to go through but when he brings them to the surface instead of trying to tuck them away you know i go this is this is exciting 
because I know it's another thing that I'm going to have freedom from. And there's a lot. There's a lot in there. You know, I've had lots of prayer over the years and, you know, just allowed people to come around me and pray for me and pray things off of me. And I think that to me is the most amazing thing when you can see like he transforms what he wanted for me, what, you know, God's desire is for us to be loved and to know love and have relationship with him. And we close that off, you know, through our circumstance, through whatever. And I had to go through it all. I had to experience Satanism. I had to experience witchcraft. I had to experience all the drugs and everything that I did to be able to get to a place of total freedom. So, you know, people are always like, Kat, do you have regrets? 100% I regret my whole life. I regret it. If I could change it, it never would have happened. But I can't. But what I can change is how I go forward and who I can impact by my truth. And that's what it's about for me. Well, thank you for trusting us enough to yeah. sit down and have this conversation. I'm, I'm, I feel really honored for you to come here and share your story with us and our listeners and uh, just the vulnerability and the courage that it takes. And you know, from my part, from the moment I met you, there's a softness in your eyes Thank and you. there's a glow and a love in your countenance and hearing more of what you've been through. It just, it just gives, creates so much hope mm -hmm. for people who are struggling through difficult things in life. And I just realized from a very, in a very personal way, how important that is. So thank you for being a beacon of hope for being such a light and and sharing your story. I know many people are being affected by it and and we are for sure. So thank you again for just coming and spending this time with us. Today. Thank you. Thank you. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at exoduscry.com and join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.